Praise the Lord. Awesome. Everybody blessed today? Well, welcome. I'm so glad to be with you. I appreciate you being here. Uh, Sue and I are just ecstatic about being with you for a few sessions, a few weeks, and so that's awesome. I also want to let you know we've released, since I was here last, our newest book, Rhythms of Grace, Rhythms of Grace. And these are disciplines in our lives that keep us free from worry and fear and anxiety. And brothers and sisters, I wrote this in the middle of COVID and just seeing the fear and the worry and the anxiety. I know there were concerns. I had concerns. But God doesn't want us to be fearful or worry or filled with anxiety. And I saw the whole country. I saw, I saw the world manipulated by spirits of fear. And that was a dress rehearsal, saints. There's some things on the horizon that are coming that are a lot worse. And we have to be settled in our faith. We have to be free from all this worry and fear and not make decisions based out of fear. And so that's where this book came from. A lot of good topics. I've got relationship versus religion. How many of you are glad you've been delivered from religion? (laughs) That's worse than sin, I guarantee you. Power of choice the choices we make, gardening your heart, how to garden your heart with Jesus, not just guard it, but gardening it, sobriety of heart, the power of humility, walking in humility. I like this chapter, avoiding spoilage, avoiding spoilage. So many of us have been innocently spoiled by the things that are all around us, and we need to to avoid that. Uh, being a living sacrifice. We need to learn how to be living sacrifices. So anyway, Rhythms of Grace, that's available in the foyer. I've got a signed copy here for somebody. Anybody want this one? All right, find somebody that looks like they're scared to death and give them that. Some of you still kept your hands up. Hallelujah. Bless your hearts. All right, let's turn to Matthew 24. I'm Boiling over with excitement. Father, thank you for your goodness in our lives. We are so blessed. Thank you for these precious people. Thank you for your church. Your church and how that you're sanctifying a remnant in these last of the last days. Thank you for being born for such a time as this. We are not here by accident, but by divine design. Help us to be all you've called us to be and do all you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I want to begin a series this morning on the subject of deception, and I want to encourage you in some safeguards, safeguards against deception. I am literally amazed as I travel and and, and speak at different places and conferences at how many people are absolutely deceived, and the darkness of this world is absolutely overcoming their hearts. How many of you know that we are not children of darkness anymore, but we're children of light? And we need to be and act like children of light in the midst of the darkness. We are kosher dwellers, hallelujah. I don't know if you know your Bible well enough to know that in the 10 plagues, there was great darkness over Egypt, a type of the world. It got so dark that they couldn't see their hand in front of their face. And yet in Gosha, that's where the people of God dwelt, there was light, supernatural light in the midst of the darkness. And we are to be that people of Gosha. We are to be light and salt in this earth. And yet I see the darkness affecting the church in some cases more than the church affecting the darkness. A lot, of, a lot of people, when I share on these cultural issues or things we're facing in our families, in our businesses, in our churches, real life, real life, they think I have a problem with people in darkness. They think I'm, I'm condemning people in darkness. Saints, it's impossible for me to condemn anybody in the darkness. Jesus said they're already condemned. That is the condemnation of the world. They have loved darkness and embraced darkness. And God brought us out of that, and God wants to bring them out of that. And yet we have to deal with some of these issues of deception. There are approximately 52 verses in the New Testament alone that warn us of deception. 
that talk about deceivers and being deceived and how that in the last of the last days, the darkness, the deception of the world will creep into the church. And it's one thing to be lost and in darkness. It's another thing to be a child of light and in the darkness. Jesus said, man, if you're a child of light and there's darkness in you, there's no greater darkness than that. And so we need to have these safeguards in place that'll keep us from being deceived. I love these things I'm about to share, and I want to encourage you to, to learn these things if you don't know them, to secure them in your heart so that we can get them into our children, so that we can get them into our young people, because the darkness is so great today that a lot of even young people that are, are raised in church, once they go out into the world, the world just engulfs them. That's not God's plan, amen? That's not God's will. So I'm going to be looking at some people that were deceived in the Bible and learn from them because God shared these things about people in the Bible deceived, not to put the people down. He loved those people. He shared those things to help encourage us not to follow that path. And so let's look at this. Let's start in Matthew chapter 24, verse 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Man, that's alarming. Many will come, and they will preach another Jesus. They'll preach another gospel. They'll be of another spirit and deceive not a few, but many saints. I tell you, when you see our, our college campuses and you see young people marching, protesting, against Israel and calling for the genocide of the Jewish people, we're in trouble. I used, to, I used to sit around and I couldn't understand slavery. I couldn't understand how the whole world was locked into slavery. And then as I got older and I saw how people embrace abortion, how they support the eliminating of human life in the womb, and they, they literally worship at the altar of abortion, and this cult of death, then I began to understand, even politically, how there could be slavery and how people could be deceived in that generation. And we're just as deceived in some cases in our generation. I used to sit around and think, how could there be a Holocaust? How can that happen? It almost seems impossible to me. And yet, if you look at what's happening, not only in America today, but in the world, you'll understand the Holocaust. You'll understand how it happens with deception, with hiding the truth, with propaganda in the media, with hate in people's heart, with bigotry, all these things that Jesus has delivered us from. We see it rising in our culture again, and we need to not be deceived. When people are hollering from the, from the river to the sea, eliminating everyone from the river to the sea. We got young people on college campus that don't know what river they're talking about and what sea they're talking about. They're talking about the River Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea and killing all the Jews in Israel. And yet they can't see it. They can't see it. They're, they're blinded by the darkness of their heart. We need to come out from among them, saints, and not partake of that kind of darkness. And we need to teach our children some safeguards on how to guard the heart so that you don't wake up one day and you're calling for the genocide of the Jewish people. That's real. That's real life. That's real deception in our world. And yet some of that is in the church. In the church. Jesus said, take heed to yourselves that you be not deceived. It's our responsibility not to be deceived, not somebody else's. I need that to sink in for a minute. It's, your, it's not my responsibility that you be not deceived. It's my responsibility to teach you safeguards to keep from being deceived. But it's not my responsibility to keep you from being deceived. It's your responsibility before God not to be deceived. And this was the same thing that God said in Deuteronomy, I've got a lot of scriptures, so I'm going to have to read some of these to you. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 16, I'm just going to read this quickly. Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. This is to an old covenant people. 
God is speaking to His people that are not even born again, not filled with the Spirit, do not have the discernment that you have as a New Testament believer, and yet He's telling them, do not be deceived. And if you're deceived, you'll wind up serving idols, false gods. All of the idols that have crept into the church at large, saints, they didn't come in by accident. They came in because we did not take heed and guard our hearts, and then we began to, in deception, worship other gods. And there are so many gods in our culture being worshipped, we need to come out from among them, partake not of their evil deeds, love people with all our heart, absolutely, but not embrace any darkness in our culture. And again, I'm not amazed at the darkness in the world. Now, I am amazed at how fast and quick things are becoming dark. I never dreamed I would, I would live to see the things I'm, I'm seeing in our world. Uh, the writers of the Scripture I don't believe would have ever dreamed to see the things we're facing in our culture and have to even deal with it on a basic biblical level. And so I'm not, I'm not surprised there's darkness. I am surprised at how dark and how quick it's getting darker. But the surprise is Christians that are falling away. That's the surprise. How can we believe some of the things that are exalted in our culture if we're not deceived? You cannot believe some of these things without help, saints. You have to have help. Now, don't get mad at me. I, I'm going to be here for a few weeks, but you have to have help to believe there's a hundred and something genders. You have to have help to believe that. You can't believe that on your own. And yet, how many people in the church are confused and don't know there's only two genders, brothers and sisters? And I'm not saying that to be mean. My heart breaks for somebody that doesn't know they're a boy and a girl. Their lives are on the path of total destruction and despair and literal suicide. So my heart goes out to somebody in that kind of confusion and I want to help them. But I have a responsibility to the church to make sure I help you safeguard your heart from that kind of a deception. From that kind of a deception. And on and on I could go. And I want to come back. And so I'll leave some things alone for now. Because you'd be shocked at how deceived Christians are at large. It would just alarm you if you really had eyes to see. And that is not God's plan. And deception always leads to idolatry, according to Deuteronomy 11 here. And deception always leads, listen, to destruction in your life. Once you're deceived and you believe a lie and you embrace a lie, it brings a form of death into your life, even as a Christian. And so we need these safeguards. We need to understand how to take heed, how to guard our hearts against all, all deception. All right, let me give you three quick passages. Again, there's, there's at least 52 in the New Testament alone that warn us about deception. And so I'm going to go through these quick just to make a point, okay? I'm not teaching on these scriptures. I'm trying to show you how clear the scriptures are about dece deception. They'll put this up on the screen if you want to go there. Galatians chapter 6, we'll, we'll start there. We're going to look at three scriptures real, real quick. And I'm amazed at our lack of discernment. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, do not be deceived. Can I get a witness? That's pretty clear. <laughs> you know, some things in the Bible are hard. There's nuance. There's, there's depth to it, and there's, you got to dig. Other things just slap you right upside the head. You have to have help again to miss it. Like, don't commit adultery. I mean, you know, that's pretty simple. Well, I wonder what he meant. Don't wonder. Don't commit adultery. Don't be sleeping with your, your neighbor's spouse. Uh, thou shalt not steal. I wonder what he meant. I, I think he meant thou shalt not steal. Pretty clear. Pretty simple. But you'd be surprised when all the, the chaos in the streets were taking place 
in 2020 and the summer of so-called love and people were burning cities down, looting stores, and now because nothing was really done, you have people now that are stealing cars and that pull up to stores and loot the store. Lewd? Is that? Lewd. I said that right. It sounded like nude to me or something, but <laughs> lewd the stores, steal the stuff, put it in the car, and drive away, okay? And that's not condemned. That's not considered sin. That's not considered evil and wrong. You ever notice that nobody sins anymore? Everybody's just oppressed. No, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, and some things are just wrong. They're outright wrong, and you have to be deceived not to see that they, are, that they are wrong. This is pretty plain. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. If you sow to your flesh, you will reap of your flesh, not of God, but you'll reap of your flesh um, destruction. You'll reap of your flesh corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. I've literally heard ministers stand up and say that this law of sowing and reaping is not for the church today. It's not for people under New Testament grace. I mean, that's spooky to me. I mean, I can misspeak. I can be wrong. I think we're all wrong in areas because none of us have arrived. But to... Take a scripture that opens up with, do not deceive, be deceived. That God's not going to be mocked. Whether you're deceived or you're not deceived, God will not be mocked. If you sow to your flesh, you're going to reap corruption. And yet preachers standing up and saying, well, the law of sowing and reaping is not for us today. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, the Bible says, as long as the earth remains. Can I get a witness? The earth is still remaining, no matter what Al Gore says. And that the earth is going to remain until God says so, no matter what any politician says. As long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and hot, it's going to get cold. It's going to get hot. I mean, how many, how many, how many of you know it's going to get hot? <laughs> there's going to be winter and summer, and there's going to be day and night. As long as the earth remains. It didn't say as long as the old covenant remains. It says as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest. So if somebody stands up and just says, hey, that scripture is not for us today, they're deceived. And I'm not being mean. I'm trying to put some safeguards in the few of us that love Jesus. And there's a lot less of us that love Jesus than, than I actually thought, even as I travel and as I... As I go out, there, there is a remnant, thank God. There, there are people that are loyal to Jesus. They love Jesus, and, and they're for real. But not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody that attends a church really loves Jesus. And that's sad to me, because especially in the churches I minister in, man, I expect you to love Jesus above all things. Amen? And so we're not going to be deceived. If we live after our flesh and sow to our flesh, we will of our flesh reap corruption. I love that it's of our flesh that we reap the corruption, not of God. God loves you whether you sow to your flesh or sow to the Spirit. God will never leave or forsake you. God loves you with a pure, unmerited, unconditional love. You can't do enough to get Him to love you more. You can't do enough to get him to love you less. He loves you. But he also loves you so much. He says, hey, if you sow to your flesh, don't let anybody deceive you. It's going to bring a harvest. And so you have to learn to believe for crop failure. Amen. I know some of you. We need to believe for crop failure. Amen. All right, let's look at another one that's just plain. Because of the culture, it's controversial. But it shouldn't be controversial at all. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Do you not know, and the answer is most people don't, <laughs> do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not 
be deceived. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. <laughs> Amen. I can read that and think of names that are sitting right among us. Hallelujah. <laughs> and such were some of you. He didn't say you did those things. He said, this is who you were. This was your identity. This was your nature. These are the things you embraced and you identified with. And he says, but such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God. Yeah, somebody better say thanks. And I like that it's an extensive list. He didn't pick on anybody. God loves everybody. But He loves us so much, and He meets us where we are, not to embrace and, and defend who we are when He meets us, but to get us out of who we are were in Adam. God meets us where we are. And if you're, if, if you're into fornication and, and embracing fornication and you are a fornicator, then you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. You're lost. And don't be deceived. And church, we don't need to be deceived is who he's talking to. And yet, be honest, how many people have you seen totally deceived that there's parts of that list that are celebrated in our culture. There's parts of that list that are called natural and normal, and we're not supposed to just be tolerant anymore, but we're supposed to embrace and celebrate. Amen. That's called deception. Amen. I'm in a hurry, thank God. No, he, he meant what he said and said what he meant. And he told us, do not be, de be deceived. So see, when I'm dealing with adultery and people that are adulterers, I'm not condemning them. I'm not trying to hurt them. I'm not attacking them. There's a difference in committing adultery and being an adulterer. Adulterers embrace adultery. Adulterers celebrate adultery. Adulterers by nature want to sleep with everybody. They meet and they celebrate it in their heart. There's a difference in a Christian that used to be an adulterer and God called us out and then we got ourselves in a bad situation and we didn't put any safeguards up and we wound up committing adultery. Just because... You committed adultery doesn't mean you're an adulterer. That's why I can be firm with you. I can rebuke you in love and say, quit that. Come out of that. That's not who you are. You're a new creation now. You got weak. The devil tricked you. You got deceived. You thought something was love that I'm going to show you is not love. And you fell. Now get back up. Repent. See, I can, I can talk to you different than I would talk to somebody that's bound to darkness. Because you're a child of light, I can, I can tell you to repent. I can tell you to turn. I can tell you this is, this is wrong and you better, you better get out of it. It'll mess your head up. It'll mess your family up. It'll mess your legacy up. Are you with me? See, there's a difference in being a liar by nature. Not all politicians, but some of them <laughs> are just liars. They're psychopathic liars. I could name one right now. Everybody would know. The guy cannot tell the truth because he's a liar. Now, I believe everybody in this building this born again has lied. Now, maybe you, you believe you haven't. But I have lied before since I got saved. But you know what the difference was in me lying and being a liar? I said I wasn't going to teach on all this. Sorry is a liar by nature embraces his or her lies and becomes psychopathic in lying. They don't even know what the truth is anymore. You and I, who are a new creation, the righteousness of God, born again, we lie, and if I had time, I could tell you why we lie. I could tell you why I lied. I was protecting myself. Amen. I just flat out lied. 
But see, because I'm not a liar, that's who I used to be. That's who we were, was liars. Now when I lie, I feel bad about it. I feel convicted about it, and I repent. I've, I've actually, <laughs> I've gotten so good at this, it hadn't happened lately. Thank God, I, I quit lying. I'm doing much better. But I would be lying to somebody at church. Again, I know that you're not coming back. I get it. People just aren't honest. And so things like people come up with me, and last week I asked you to pray for me. Did you pray for me? Well, yeah. I know you've never done stuff like that. I get it. And the minute I did it, you know, I prayed in general for the church. See, I justified it. Lord, I pray for the church. Well, I prayed for every one of you, amen, the church. And you know how I broke that? Through repentance and looking somebody in the eye and just crucifying my flesh right in front of them saying, I just lied to you. I didn't pray for you. I didn't even think about you all week long. (laughs) It'll break that old spirit of lying, right? I can guarantee you. And so he said, this is who you were, but that's not who you are anymore. You've been washed. You've been sanctified. You've been justified. You've been glorified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So come out from all that stuff and put that stuff off now and be not deceived. Do not be deceived. And yet how many people, be honest, are deceived? Their children have gotten off into some things that the scriptures absolutely violate in clear scripture, but they're renouncing their faith now because their children have fallen off the cliff. That's not how you save your children from falling off the cliff, is agreeing with them in darkness. You have to speak the truth now in love, and you have to embrace them and, and believe God to deliver them from any of the darkness. All right, let's look at another quick one. And then we'll, we'll get out of the introduction. Um, <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5. <laughs> Ephesians, this one right here amazes me. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. This you know, and I wonder, do we really know? For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, covetous man who is an idolatry has any inheritance in the kingdom of of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with these empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet there are people that talk about no wrath to come. How many of you know we're not under the wrath of God under this dispensation of grace? God's not pouring wrath out on you. He's not cursing you. He's he's not killing our kids. He's not stealing our wealth. He's not making us sick. He's not punishing us. He's not pouring out curses on us. Jesus bore those according to Galatians 3.13 on the cross. And yet there is wrath to come. Wrath is coming. It's not going to come on the children of God, but on the children of disobedience. And he says, don't let anybody deceive you. And yet so much is said even in church about how God loves everyone and somehow another God loving everyone translates into everybody's going to heaven and not everybody's going to heaven. And and there are people that literally teach today there's no hell. I knew of a man personally I'd been in his office before. I don't want to say any more. I, I, I'm not the issue in him. The issue is he got off into a doctrine that there is no hell. And he got off into a doctrine, listen, that even the devil ultimately is going to be saved. See, that's deception. The devil doesn't want to be saved. The devil used to be saved. The devil's already been saved and rejected it. That's how he got His glutus maximus kicked out of heaven was renouncing his salvation and took upon him a a lower state and and the angels that bit into his lie. So those are just three quick examples of direct, be not deceived. But how many people are being deceived with even direct scripture that says do not be deceived? 
We need safeguards. We need to understand some basics. Because this used to bother me. It used to bother me. I, I don't know how to articulate this exactly. Don't know that I've even done well with articulating it to Sue. But I, I had seen this years ago. And there are so many scriptures. Do not be deceived. Let no man deceive you. The deceivers that are in the world. Go to 1 Timothy and we'll look at some of these things about the deceivers in the world, that I, I, I don't know. I was just concerned, am I going to be deceived? Because see, again, we're all wrong about something, right? If you're honest, and I know that's very few of us, but there, there, there are just times I thought it was that way. And then, and then walking with Jesus, I discovered it's not that way. That that is the way of man that seems right in his own eyes, but leads to destruction. And then there is a way, God's way, that leads to life and happiness and fruitfulness and healthy homes, great careers. God has a plan. Man, I'm sorry. I get all excited. God has got such a great plan for every one of us saints. It is just awesome awesome what God has for us, and yet we've allowed many of us, the world, to deceive us where we are falling so short of God's best for our lives. God has great things for each and every one of us, and truly serving Jesus is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Yet many people sit in church and, and they feel like serving God is hard. They feel like they're being cheated. They're so deceived on the goodness of God that they really do believe sin is better and living in sin is funner than living in righteousness. Help us, Jesus. And so just in digging all this out in my personal walk with the Lord, I'm not saying I was afraid, but I just want to be right so bad. I, I want to be right. I, I may be wrong about things, and I'm open to that always, but I want to be right. And man, I just had this, I guess, anxiousness that there's so many scriptures, be not deceived. I thought, well, maybe, maybe I'm going to be deceived. And then I started seeing people, I mean, ministers, just fall off the cliff. Church members, people that you respect, that... You sit here today and you look at these precious people and you say, man, it's so good seeing, I don't want to name a, Joe, a, a name, so I started Joe and I got a friend Joe here, I don't want to go there, so Billy Bob. I don't think anybody's named Billy Bob. <laughs> Billy Bob Popper <laughs> sits here and he just loves Jesus, he's, he's a good person, and then all of a sudden you just see them fall off a cliff and they're just doing things that are really bad. And then when you try to talk to them about it, they defend it. See, it's one thing, again, doing something bad. I think all believers fall and fail. But it's another thing, defending bad, justifying bad. And so I just had this concern. Look at, look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says, I love that, expressly says. <laughs> you know, sometimes you say something, and then other times you expressly say it. The Spirit, this is God, expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of devils. Wow. Does that not just kind of at least alarm you? And be honest, I'm not going to name anything. I want everybody to relax. I'm trying to help you. I don't want to make you nervous or uncomfortable. But again, when you look at some things in our culture, it is absolutely deceiving spirits and doctrines of devils. And anybody really born again, spirit-filled, and has any of these safeguards I'm going to get into would know immediately, that's the devil. And yet, many in the culture are so deceived that they think it's healthy. They celebrate it. They condemn anybody like me who opposes it. Like affirming, affirming a 12-year-old girl that thinks she's a boy. 
And that now, if we don't repent soon and we don't see a great awakening soon, you're going to lose your children because they're saying, if you don't affirm, they call it gender affirm, a 12-year-old girl that thinks she's a boy, you are demonstrating child abuse and DHS will take your child away from you. That's the path we're on. Saints, that's deception. That's evil. That is wrong. And see, anybody that's a child of light would celebrate what I'm saying, but children of darkness oppose me like I oppose them in their darkness and say that that is healthy, that is good. Her not being comfortable with her body, and now let's remove body parts of a 12-year-old. That's a deceiving spirit. That is a doctrine of the devil. That is cruel. That is child abuse. That's psychological child abuse. It's physical child abuse. And yet, I come under assault for just saying what I just said. And yet, people have taken heed to these seducing spirits, these deceiving spirits, and these doctrines of devils to a point that they really believe it. They believe that's a good thing. And that's spooky to me. You know, things used to be clear. I, I, I almost wish I was a preacher in the 50s even. You wouldn't have to... Nobody believed a guy could wake up and be a girl. Nobody. I'm serious. Nobody believed that. And if you'd have said that on the 6 o'clock news or even at church, people would have laughed at you, thought you were a kook. And yet today, I'm telling you, people really believe it. And while we've got to love them and while we've got to keep reaching out to anyone in darkness, we can't let the darkness deceive us. That's my point. This is what I don't understand. How come, how come we can't get this either? I'm, I'm not against anybody in gender confusion. I love them. I've ministered privately to many of them. I love them. But I love you too, and I love God more than all of you, and I'm going to speak the truth in love so that we can grow up. We got to grow up. We have to quit sitting around waiting to go up and grow up where no one can deceive us. Because once I got over that anxiety of being deceived and I saw, wait a minute, Jesus said, just take heed and let no man deceive me. He wouldn't tell me to do something I couldn't do. He wouldn't tell me to do something he won't empower me to do. I don't have to be deceived. I may be wrong about certain things and I have to keep seeking God. And I'll get into that. A safeguard of humility in your life. But I don't have to be deceived, brothers and sisters, and you don't have to be deceived by this, this culture that God prophesied of and said, in the last days, in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. We're seeing people depart from the faith and giving heed to these deceiving spirits and doctrines of devil. Why is it not my responsibility to make sure we're established in the faith not be deceived so we won't depart. I don't want any of you departing from the faith. Amen. Look at what they do. Speaking lies in hypocrisies. Having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And then he just gives a, a few examples in their culture. Forbidding to marry. Commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now he just brings out a couple of things in their culture that people were deceived over, and he's countering it. I can't imagine what he would have wrote if he was alive today. Amen. I mean, it would have been, it would have been fiery, I guarantee you. It would have been so controversial. This was controversial in their day, 
And things are controversially controversial in our day because of the times. They weren't controversial 50 years ago, 100 years ago. It's the times that have made it controversial, not the preacher. Okay. Go to 2 Timothy. He names four different things or five different things there that happen. People depart from the faith. They give heed to these deceiving spirits. Number three, doctrines of devil. devils. They speak lies in hypocrisies. They want you to pay your fair share in taxes, but they don't pay their fair share in taxes. They want you to go on governmental health care. That isn't any good. While they have their personal private health care. And on and on we could go. They pass laws that they themselves exempt themselves from. They're hypocrites. And we can't be that way. We have to learn to speak the truth in love and we have to learn to be consistent in our principles, in our values, in our faith. 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 3, verse 12. Paul is speaking of all his persecutions, opposition, trials, afflictions. And then he says in verse 12, Yea, or yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Can I help you quickly? I was deceived for years <laughs> thinking if I lived godly, everybody would celebrate my life. Everybody would love me. Everybody would like me. I was deceived. I thought all the rejection in my life was from being a bad person, from doing something wrong, from mistreating somebody, from saying something I shouldn't have said. Remember all that when you were a kid, especially a teenager? You bring so much stuff on yourself by just dumb to the second power. <laughs> Y'all don't remember being a teenager? <laughs> just looking back, it's like, well, I brought that on myself. And so I had this idea that I'm going to serve Jesus. I'm going to be nice to people. I'm going to be kind. I'm going to love with his kind of love. And it's like all of Hades broke loose. And yet many of you, I love you, but you're operating in a form of deception, not realizing if you really live godly, you're going to have opposition. Our children are going to have opposition. They're going to be mocked. We better, we better prepare them. They're going to be made fun of. If they to go to most of these college campuses after they graduate, they're going to be taught to deny the faith. I'm serious. And if they live godly, see, this will help you if you want help. There's godly. Jesus, loving Him, allegiance to Him, celebrating Him. Then, there's conservative. <laughs> then, there's liberal. Then, there's outright communist. Okay? So, if they're attacking somebody here, and you're over here, why do you not think they're coming after you next? Do you know what the number one deception in the country is right now? Christian nationalist. Christian nationalist. They're worse than terrorist. Christian nationalism. They're finally getting over here where they're starting to use Christian. And Christians are the problem. And if we could just get rid of the Christians, if we could just eliminate the Christians, if we could just shut the churches down. Some of you, I love you, but you thought COVID-19 was about a virus. You had no idea what the ultimate agenda was, was to shut the church down. Shut the truth down. Shut Goshen down. 
In order for darkness to progress, you've got to get rid of the light. You've got to shut down the light. In order for lies, outright lies to be exalted, you have to attack the truth. You have to censor the truth. You have to cancel the truth. And yet, Christians don't even see what's going on. And they're voting for people that hate them. They're voting for people that ultimately are coming after them. Like sheep to the slaughter. We need some safeguards. But evil men, verse 13, but evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Can you at least see why I'm trying to reach a few of you with safeguards of deception? Of deception? The Bible tells us that things in the world are not going to get better. They're going to get worse and worse. And there will be people deceived that will become deceivers. But you must continue in the things which you have learned, amen, and been assured of knowing from whom you've learned them, and that from a child, from childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture, the Bible, is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete or mature, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The number one safeguard from deception is to continue in the Word of God. To let God's word be true and every man a liar. And, and you don't see the word of God being exalted in most of our churches, in most of our lives. I'm running out of time, but I, I wanted to talk about Eve and the path of, of deception. Go to Genesis 3. Let's close with this. Genesis chapter 3. And here we see the clear path of deception. We see the first deception on the planet with Eve and the process, the unmistakable path. You cannot be deceived, brothers and sisters, in these last days unless you take this path. You must choose this path to be deceived. The Bible says that Adam was not deceived but the woman, being deceived, fell into transgression. 1 Timothy 2.14. Look at verse 1 of Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more cunning than all the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Hath God indeed said, You shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of all the trees uh, of the fruit of the trees of all the gar of the garden, but of the tree or the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, "You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die." Then the serpent said to the woman, "You shall not die; you shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will know, you will be like God, knowing good and evil." So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree desirable to make one wise. She took of the fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband that was with her and he did eat. The path to deception starts very clear. Hath God said? Did God really say there's two genders? Did God say that's not love, it's fornication? Did God say, hath God said a marriage is between a man and a woman? Hath God really said that? Hath God said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? Hath God said? All deception starts with questioning what God said. That's why if we live long enough, I may not see it, depending on the rapid pace as we come to the end. But some of you may see the day that the Bible is not just forbidden in our schools, but the Bible and reading the Bible publicly, even in church, will be for forbidden. The devil cannot destroy man till you get rid of the Bible. You have to get rid of truth. It's just that simple, and God's Word is truth. And so the devil always questions what God says. Then you say, well, yeah, God said, 
Then the devil says, God did not say that. You will not die if you eat of that tree. And then the third thing in this path always happens. God is cheating you. God is holding things back from you. If you eat, if you partake of sin, if you disobey God, you'll be smarter than you are now. And can anybody who sinned really good testify that sin makes you dumb? Nobody? Man, I'm tired of being the only person. I can look back and see I thought I was having fun and I was killing myself. I was hurting everybody. But I thought I'd be happier. I thought I was smarter than God. Boy, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Go ahead and eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you'll be so wise. We think we can know good without God. We think we can know evil without God. And today we call evil good because we don't have God. We call good evil because we don't have God. And AI may be the destruction of the human race. There's things I see just as clear, and I don't know if it's, I don't know why I can see certain things. I really don't. I don't I'm not a prophet. I'm just a believer. I am a teacher, but I mean, I look at AI will one day become the ultimate tree of the knowledge of good and evil that man will eat of independent of God. AI can only spit out what is put in. And even if these computers become self-aware, which I think, I think we're on that path, they don't have a conscience. They don't have discernment. They're only going to be able to receive of the information that we have available. And can I get a witness? Most of the knowledge we have today is fraudulent. It's lies. It's perversion. It's deception. Can you imagine programming a supercomputer with all the filth of the knowledge we have in this world independent of God? How evil that would be? how destructive that could be. I've only probably got one friend here that has any idea what I'm talking about. Because this stuff is, is spooky. This stuff is real. Uh, we are eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what man calls good. Have you not seen that there are people in our culture that literally call good evil? And literally call outright evil good. I can't imagine a supercomputer with that much death in it and what conclusions it will come to. We need some safeguards. I said, We need some safeguards. We need some guardrails. We need some guardrails bad. Amen. And the number one guardrail, I've got about 10, I probably won't get to all of them that are real in my own life, but the number one guardrail is God's Word. When you hear the world say, hath God said, does the Bible really say that? Yeah, the Bible says it. Well, that's not true. No, it is true, and you are not true. And you say it with a smile, with love in your heart. Because so much, so many lies, so much fraud. I'm telling you, it's like we're being boiled like a frog in a bucket. And we're going to die. And you need to turn the heat down. I'm going to be turning the heat down, hallelujah, from the world so that you can have discernment and not deception in this hour. How many of you going to come back? Hallelujah. You're going to come back. Amen. All right. All right. <laughs> Hallelujah.